Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It is Melissa Vera, and she is an entrepreneur, an influencer. She ha she is a mother, and she is also uh, married, and she tends to her husband. She has a lot of responsibilities going on, and with all these things going on in her life, she's going to tell you a little about herself and how to overcome challenges because when you have a lot going on in your life, you know, it gets hard to cope with a lot of different things and to balance everything out. So she's here to tell you how to do it. Now, before we begin, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Happy Wellness Expo. They're going to be in Livingston, New Jersey, and they want you to come. They're going to have natural products there. They're going to have different exhibitors, coaches, doctors. They're going to have different technologies there. And you might even get a free massage here or there. So you know, check it out. He, their information will be in the description box and they're still looking for exhibitors. So if you want to share or get a table, you can find the number on the bottom of the description and give them a holler. So Melissa, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I just, I love, you know, what you stand for and I love what you do, but why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do from your own perspective? Okay. First of all, I'm a mom first. Um, one of my great, all my greatest accomplishments are my three daughters. They're 29, 25 and tw be 22 this year um and they are my greatest accomplishments i've been married to my husband um who is a native of mexico so we have a very multicultural family for almost 30 <laughs> years now uh, my son-in-law like i say multicultural um i have a wonderful son-in-law i call him my son in love and both him and my daughter actually i'm in north carolina but him and my oldest daughter live in california so we're you know that let long distance mom you know i really want to be there but you know as moms you kind of have to stay back and um do that i'm also um uh I have an adopted, we call him our adopted son. He was one of our daughters, the middle daughter's eighth grade boyfriend that just stuck around and his <laughs> wife. And so I, they're included part of the family, even though my daughter and him are not together anymore. He's just holds a huge piece of my heart. And then I'm also a fur mom. I have this um, Shih Tzu. If you look at my blog or anything that I do, you'll see my Shih Tzu is all over the place. It's Allie. She's going on 14 years. And then we also have a adopted um, pit bull mix. You know, pit bulls are something that you know, a lot of people don't really want around because they're, they've are they got that really bad reputation. And so we have her, Gigi, she's nine. And then um, we also have four adopted, well, they kind of adopted us, stray cats uh, who mm -hmm. are now mm -hmm. around the house <laughs> and they kind of stay outside, but they're, they're ours. They're my babies. Yeah. Um, I'm a blogger. I'm a podcaster. I do content creation. I do YouTube videos. I basically do it all. And it, and it didn't start out like that. My life didn't right. start like this. Um, I actually was a school teacher before, you know, before we came on, we were talking about your journey with epilepsy. Well, in 2014, my, the bottom fell out of my world, the whole bottom. I mean, anything that could have happened, happened in 2014. Right. My okay. youngest daughter, who at the time was in sixth grade, was at school, had a very first seizure, scared the crap out of us. We didn't know what it was. Her pediatrician was like, there's something there. We don't know what it is. We need to send you to a neurologist to get all these tests done, but we want to go ahead and preempt you and get the test done first. But there's something on one of the, I think it was the the CAT scan, like there was a little something on there and they thought it was a possible brain tumor. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out to be epilepsy. But with her being where I was working at school and her school, our times were different. And so I could, and the, the doctor told her, go to school half days. Well, I couldn't go half days because her half days were 1030 to 130. And my half days would have been 730 to 1130. So mm -hmm. I had to stay home. So I took a leave of absence from teaching. And we thought right after spring break that I would be able to go back. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, right before spring break, like, the day before Good Friday, coming back from my middle daughter's soccer game, yeah. we were in a car accident, which put me out totally because I ended up getting a rotator cuff, um, yeah. the torn rotator cuff and having surgery and it was in so much pain. And so finally, when that was finally all done in August and I had the surgery and everything, um, my dad, who was my biggest hero, who is the man that I want to live up his legacy, um, he had been battling for years. Um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma through exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam and also the 
um, toxic water in Camp Lejeune, the contaminated water in Camp Lejeune when he was stationed there because he was in the Marines. Yeah. Um, his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma turned into simple lymphatic leukemia. And in December of 2014, he was put in hospice. And by January, he was the following year, he was gone. And that That's just funny. tore me apart. And I couldn't go back to teaching. I couldn't go back to go back to the school because he was always a big part. He would volunteer. He would do everything. He was a big part of the community. And I was like, I can't. There's just too many, too many memories of my dad right now. I cannot face that. Yeah. And so... At the time when I was teaching, I was also blogging on the side. And when I was blogging, I was like, you know what? Maybe this is God's way of telling me that I need to focus on my writing and my creative side. And because that's something that's always given me passion. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, God, if this is what you want me to do, I'm going to go full time. I'm just going to, you know, give, give it all to you. And I, if this is what you want. It's going to work out. Yeah. Well, fast forward to 2018 when I went um, I decided, you know what, I want an office outside the home. And so I told my husband, we're going, we're going to look. And he's like, no, we're not. I'm like, yeah, we are. And so he thought, oh, he thought I was going to go rent an office and just do something. But no, I went to a storage building um, place there where they sell storage buildings a lot. That's what it's called. Yeah. I went there and one of my daughter, my oldest daughter's parents, friend's parents own it. And I was like, I want to buy a storage building. And I want to create it and make it my office. And this is where I'm talking from you now. I'm actually in the block cabin. And so they, we got it. And everything inside the block cabin was, is my design. Um, and my husband did all the sweat equity, but I paid for this block cabin myself using items that I um, did for um, blogging and other things. And also, um, I did everything inside the block cabin except for my husband with the sweat equity, but I designed yeah. everything. I paid for everything. And slowly but surely I've been able to upgrade as I went on because of, you know, budget constraints and everything. Yes. But when COVID hit in, it was it 2020, I think is when I started chats on the block cabin, which is my podcast. I never thought I would ever be hosting when I bought this in 2018, that I would ever be hosting a show and doing D a DIY show and doing other yeah. things on YouTube when I bought it because get me in front of a bunch of people that are my peers and I would not be able to talk to you at all. I would not be even be able to have this conversation with you right now. Right. But get me in front of a bunch of kids. My imagination would go wild because I just loved the kids and I loved everything. But there was always that little piece in my mind that um, would, there was something spoken to me when I was a child by one of my um relatives unfortunately it was a relative close to me that said I was we were at vacation bible school and I said oh I'm so pretty and they're like don't say that you have to be modest and I'm like okay and then the other relative says well she has to say that because nobody will ever call her pretty and another relative agreed with her and that has stuck with me for like up until my 50s where I said it's it's defined who I was as a young mom it defined who I was as a wife it defined who I was period with all my self-esteem yeah. but now I'm like screw it that's got to get put in the past I've worked really hard on myself I've worked and be able to get up and do these things taking a chance and getting out of my comfort zone that's wonderful you know, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of people, I always say it's when you, when people say negative things, I've learned it's not there. It, it, they're the ones with the issues, not you, you know, yeah. and you have to have a thick skin in, the, in this world. People are very critical to actually um, criticize others, but you know, the point of finger is others, but they can't, they're, they're the ones that can't hear the truth. They're the ones that can't, you know, um, a whole constructive criticism and you know it's it's very it's it, it's very hurtful and people don't realize but when you say things to other people especially when they're young those, those things are traumatizing especially you know when you're a child or when you're growing up you know those things stick with people and I you know I remember coaching and I said to somebody you know they had very low self-esteem but they were a beautiful person and when I was talking to them, their comment to me was, when you hear someone say things so many times, you tend to believe it. And mm -hmm. that stuck with me. And I think people really have to, there's a need out there to understand that words can be very hurtful and they can, they can really 
negatively impact another human being's life. What do you think? I 100% agree that because it took, like I said, it took me until I was 50 and I was like, no, I can't do this anymore. I can't because I was, I was not the mom, not the person I wanted to be. It literally defined who I was. And I was, I was stuck with all this anxiety and this, oh, they're going to judge me or they're going to do this or they're going to do that, that I've made myself my own prison and I couldn't get out of it. Even though, you know, my husband and I were married already. We had three beautiful girls, but I still like, I just did not feel happy. I mean, and it took a while for me to actually get to that point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to live and I'm going to live. The only people that matter right now in my life is my immediate family, which was my girls Mm -hmm. and my husband. And that was it. I, my joy needed to come from them and with them and doing things with them instead of the peripheral, you know, the grandmother, grandfather, you know, the mom and dad, sisters, siblings, you know, the people that I grew up with, I couldn't allow them into that space anymore. So I had to set a boundary and say, I can't, I can't, I can't right now. I'm here if you need to be, but I can't deal with you day to day because all the toxic negative stuff coming off of them. Yes. And I I think, you know, people don't realize, but that toxicity, you know, it's energy. So when you're around negative people, it kind of drains you. And when you're around positive people, it lifts you up, you know? So how, how was it when you, when you decided, did you decide to exclude them out of your life? Or did you say, I'm going to keep a distance maybe every once in a while, you know, maybe I'll be casually, you know, cordial and say my hellos and stuff, but I'm going to put, put the, put, pull these people away from me enough where they're not going to affect me in my life. How did you do it? It was distancing because I don't think I could ever, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love the people I grew up with, right? And but I just didn't like the effect on me because I could remember coming home from my parents' house when my girls were little, we would go over to Christmas morning and I would come home and just go in my room and cry. And because I did not want my girls to see it. I didn't want it, my relationship with, especially my mom, um, impact their relationship with my mom because I wanted them to have a separate relationship. I never once told them, Hey, you can't do this. You can't do that. I've never once told them that you can't be around other family members because that's their choice. That's their relationship. But with mom, my mom, it was almost like there was a string and there wasn't unconditional love with her. It was like, you do this and I'll love you. If you do X, Y, and Z, I'll love you. And it was always really hard for me because I'm like, why can't you just love me for me? Now, going back, it's always been, it was always like that. It was like, and I always kind of gave my mom a benefit of the doubt a little bit because when my two older sisters were born, my dad was deployed. And so my mom spent a lot more time bonding with my two older sisters. Mm -hmm. And then when my sister Karen and I came along, um, my dad was about the end of his military career and he was retiring. And so he was there with us more. So I, in my childhood, I can see my dad more present than my mom. Right. And, and, you know, and I give her the benefit of the doubt because she didn't have the greatest upbringing and she learned that children were seen and not heard. And so, and she never was really great about expressing her emotions or her feelings. So whenever I would express something, she would always tell me that it was all in my head or why was I thinking that, you know, and she was never saying, well, I'm sorry, you feel this way. I'm sorry that, you know, your feelings are valid, but I don't remember any of this happening. And the greatest turnaround for me was my middle daughter and I were having a conversation because my mom just recently passed away, but was right before she passed away. Very sorry. Um, Michaela was telling me about um, her, something that happened in her childhood, and I didn't remember it happening. But I could have easily gone the way of my mom and said, oh, you're crazy. That didn't happen. Yeah. You know, I don't understand what you're saying. You know? But instead, I looked at her and I said, I don't recall this happening. But if it did, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I said, you're going to learn as parents that you make mistakes. Yes. And the fact that I could say I'm sorry to her and look right at her. And, but years ago, I would have done the same exact thing my mom would have done. Right. I'm like, it doesn't deserve any, it doesn't, it's not the right way to do it. I mean, because we don't remember things when we're, when kids, because we're in the thick of it. We don't remember things as parents. We don't remember, you know, parents don't remember stuff. So I, oh, no. I choose to forgive my mom, but when she died, it was like this huge weight was just lifted off my shoulder yeah. because there was no judgment. There was nothing there. You know, it was like, it was like almost like 
my daughter, my youngest daughter and I were having a conversation about right after she died. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't feel the grief. I feel like I'm, what I'm feeling is wrong because I didn't mourn her. Like I mourned my dad, my yeah. dad, like he was my, he was larger than life. You could cross him and he would be fine. Two weeks later, he'd be okay. My mommy crossed her. She's written you off. Yeah. And so, and she's like, that's because you had a different relationship with Grampy than you did with Nana Mama. She says, yeah. it's because you knew that whenever he needed something, he would come to you. And you knew if you picked up the phone and said, hey, dad, I need you. He right. would be right there with you. And with my mom, it was always, oh, I'll be there if your sisters don't need me. Right. I feel like, you know, I've had a similar situation in my life. And I feel like it's 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 the way they were brought up and the life they lived. It, those negative impacts, you know, they follow through. And mm -hmm. a lot of times when you're raised a certain way and you're not shown love, you don't know how to love. But then you go to the next generation, you have children, and here you are having your own children, but you were never taught to love. So you don't know how to express that love. And those negative behaviors that you you were given and that you were exposed to, you tend to repeat because that's all you know. In your environment, you think it's normal. But in the real world, it's not normal to show negative behavior and negative emotions. And for me personally, I had to learn to, I had to say to myself, okay, that person has certain medical issues. That person came from a dysfunctional family and was not taught how to love. And I forgive them. And I knew they never in their life ever said, I'm sorry to me. And I wasn't expecting, I'm sorry. But for me, I had to personally inside myself say, I forgive you. And that kind of released yeah. a lot of, a lot of, I guess, like a brick off my shoulder. Did you feel like yeah. that with yourself? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I totally felt like that. And the thing that, the thing that was really, I guess, opened my eyes more is when I kept looking at my my mom and dad's background, they both had similar backgrounds. They both came from broken homes. I mean, my dad, um, his mom and dad would get back long enough to make a baby. And then his dad would be his mom. And then, so they ended up being brought up by his grandparents right. and his mom lived in the household, but he could have been very bitter and very, but he didn't, he was like the pillar of the community. He was a police officer. He was a Marine. He was everything that you could possibly think of. He was in the Lions Club. My grandmother and later in her life ended up losing her eyesight. So he became part of the Lions Club to live on, to bring her legacy back, to continue on, to help people like his mom and just yeah. things like that, that he was always helping in the community. I mean, even though he was struck with Agent Orange, he was out there fighting for the veterans, for those that are affected by Agent Orange for veteran mm -hmm. rights. And he could have easily had just sat back and said, poor me, poor me, poor me. Right. But instead he, he didn't. I mean, even when he was, he was still fighting when he was in hospice. I mean, literally he did not want to go. Mm -hmm. And we finally had to tell him it's okay, dad, you can leave. We'll, we'll be fine. But he didn't want to leave. And it's just, it's his, his approach was he was community centered where my mom was more self-centered, yes. not meaning it in a bad way, but that's the way that she was brought up that you looked after yourself. Yes. And then maybe afterwards you looked after everybody else. And not to say that she was a bad mom, but I yeah. knew there was a difference between the way she treated my two older sisters and my sister, Karen and I. And then when yeah. Karen died, Karen passed away when I was six months pregnant with my oldest daughter and she passed away from cancer as well. So cancer hit my family twice. Wow. And, um, she, when she passed away, I felt like I lost my best friend because we grew up together. We shared a room together. It was only a year between us in school. We yeah. were like all the time together, her husband I still consider my brother I am the only one in the family that actually talks to him now because yeah. they don't you know all this stuff going on with her yeah. and then when I, then I was like okay I feel like I don't have a family and I actually said that one day to my mom I was like I feel like I'm not part of the family anymore I feel like I'm only consulted when you actually need me to do something for you right and so when my dad died I was like now I definitely feel like I don't have a family yeah. And so it was like, that's when I decided, you know what, I've got to concentrate on the family that I have. Yes. 
And mm -hmm. one of the greatest compliments I had, I was out last year visiting my daughter. She's getting her PhD um, in California. Oh, and nice. she, um, she was sitting there saying, mama, I don't think of you as my mom. And I was like, what, what? You know, that's like my backup. And yeah, she's yeah. like, no, let me finish. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let you finish. And she says, I think of you as a friend who happens to be my mom. Aww. And that was one of the greatest compliments I could have gotten in my lifetime because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted the relationship with my girls that I didn't have with my mom. Yeah. My girls could come and tell me and they could talk about their emotions. And sometimes when we all, all of us get together, we do hash out a lot of stuff and we cry, even though we don't want to, we yeah. end up, everything just bubbles up when we start crying, but we know in the end that we're, they're loved and I'm loved by them. Yes. You know, they know in the end that it's okay. We can talk about stuff. Yeah. Because it's healthier that way. Oh, it most definitely is. That's the same relationship I wanted with my children. I want I was their mother, yes, and I'm going to give them guidance and I'm going to I'm going to, you know, at times when they were younger growing up, I was going to show them discipline and lead them on the right path. But I also wanted to know to for them to know that I am their friend where they can come to me and I will never judge them. They could talk to me about anything and I won't judge you. Even if you do something wrong, I will listen. I will learn to understand from your perspective. Let's talk about it, go over it. And if you make a mistake, let's see how we don't repeat that mistake again. Mm -hmm. I so agree. And, you know, and it's so great because, you know, Maddie will sit there and talk to her friends out in California. She talked to them and we were going over to a friend's house one night for dinner. And she was like, and then her friends had all these little like stuff on the walls or um, what was the word I'm looking for? Lyrics. Yeah. Of, um, the stallion songs and things like that. They had vinyled it up there and they were like, oh my gosh, we need to cover it up for Maddie's mom. And Maddie's <laughs> like, no, you don't. My mom is cool. She could care less. <laughs> like, she could care less if there's, you know, bad words on the walls or anything. She says, because she's not going to judge you. She's just going to be happy that I have friends out here and yeah. get some and be a part of you know know you and now they call me mama vera you know they're like we're yeah. friends like, like hey mama vera how are you doing you know and things like that so that's amazing i love it i love it now when you were going through the grief and all right so it seems like your mother has some narcissistic tendencies so and and she seemed like she came from a dysfunctional family that she never learned how to love so she had a combo of the two it seemed and you know, and then you also lost your father. So you had, you know, grief. How did you get over those obstacles? One with your mother, you said that it was kind of like a let go, you know, it was, it was, you know, like a brick off your shoulders, which is not a bad thing because I personally have had friends that had had similar situations like you. And when one friend, her mother passed, she was sad, but at the same time, she was relieved because she felt like, a lot of pressure was left over, you know, lifted up from her. A lot of, of the pain was lifted up from her and she didn't feel guilty about it because, you know, she, from her perspective, she did everything she could the right way from her side. So mm -hmm. she did not have guilt. Some people will carry guilt because, you know, but you shouldn't, you know, Alone, you know, you do the best we can as humans and we do make mistakes as humans, but we have to learn that we have to forgive ourselves when we do make mistakes and everybody is human when nobody is perfect. And I, I think people have to realize that. And, you know, those, you know, the media TV shows, those are all facades, you know, we are human yeah. beings and, and that's normal. And then how, you know, between uh, so you you felt kind of lifted up when your mother passed but then your father had passed and you had the grief now for a lot of people people get stuck in that grief when we lose someone and as i was telling you before the show i had three people who died six months apart from each other during covid you lost your father who was that's a tremendous loss because you were so close to him how did you get over the grief and how were you able to move past that obstacle? Because many people get stuck when they lose somebody because we never get over losing somebody. We just learn how to cope with it. Yeah. How did you learn how to cope with it so you could move forward in life? Actually, in the beginning, I didn't cope very well. Um, I focused a lot on my mom because my dad and my mom had been married for over 50 years and yeah. they had known each other since my dad 
was I think 13 and my mom was 11. They grew up right down the road from each other. Yeah. So I focused on my mom. And unfortunately with my dad, there was a situation where the part of the cemetery where he was going to be buried at hadn't opened yet. So they had to store his body in a mausoleum and we had to go through a second burial with him. Wow. So it seemed like whenever we were finally, things were getting better because he died in January and here comes February. February is you know, Valentine's Day. It's his birthday. It's my mom's birthday. It's their anniversary. So we get through February. We're getting through March, April, and then April hits. And they're like, okay, now we can open up the cemetery and we can rebury him. Yeah. And my mom was finally learning how to deal with her grief. And we were all kind of like, okay, mom's getting better. And then we had to go through the whole funeral again. Yeah, And I know it was like putting him in the rest, but I honestly wish that she had just had a private service and just had had us all there, put him in the ground and not had a formal service because I think it was worse on all of us for the formal service. Right. No, I hear you. And there are still days now where I really still grieve my dad. I mean, I'll go out and I'll go to this and for the longest time with my sister, Karen, because she died 29 years ago mm-hmm. this May. And with her, I think last year was the first time I could get, I should go to the cemetery and not cry. Yeah. Because I know that she's got almost everybody in the family, except for one sister and I up there, because I, what I didn't tell you was, you know, when my mom died, passed away last year, well, the year before my oldest sister had passed away in her sleep. Wow. So there's a lot there. And yeah. she was the one that lived with my mom and took care of my mom. Then it kind of was like, Oh, well you live closer. You have to be. And I'm like, I can't, physically be around her that much because it was taking a toll on me yeah and so it's hard dealing with grief but one of the things that always I always I look for symbols I'm a very visual person me too and so I looked um I've always heard that cardinals were like yes cardinals butterflies yes Mm -hmm. so uh, my thing was a cardinal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and dragonflies too dragonflies yes but um I've always looked for a cardinal. So I started surrounding myself with cardinals just to, you know, there's like, I see one right now that I'm looking at. It's over by my desk that one of my best friends gave me, but I just started surrounding myself with, you know, finding them, looking, researching, doing things, um, looking for them in nature, going out and doing walks and just being Mm -hmm. out in nature and saying, God, if this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now, show up for me, show me this, what I'm doing. And I don't know if you know what a possum is. Do you know what a possum is? Yes. Okay. Well, possums are very nocturnal animals. They don't come Mm. out during the day at all. One day, a friend of mine and I were walking. This was actually right during COVID. And we were walking on the walking path. And we looked over and it was early. It's like eight o'clock in the morning. And we looked over and we see something scrawling all across the front of us and the path. And we're like, okay, what is this? We are like going up very cautiously walking because it's a wooded area. And we look over and it was a mama possum with all her babies hanging onto her. And you oh, don't wow. see that in normally in the morning. No, time. you don't. don't see all the babies. And so mm-hmm. I was like, God, you're showing up. You're every time I've asked for a sign, he showed up and told me yeah. that this is what you where you're supposed to be. And I can remember when my dad passed away, there was this woman that oh Miss Paula, she's amazing. I've known her since I was a little girl. And we actually kept her, my mom kept her son when we were growing up. So he's like my brother. And she hugged me close and said, all this stuff you're going through, it's God calling you to him. Your faith is going to be stronger because of this. And I honestly, looking back, I see that now. Before I didn't see it when I was in the thick of things. Yeah. But now I see it because my faith is so much stronger. And I know that God has a way and that I think one of the reasons why I didn't mourn my mom as much, like, honestly I said the you know the guilt was off my shoulder yeah. but I also she was back with my dad because mm-hmm. I knew how much she'd missed my dad right right I knew how much that being able to hug my sister Karen again after 29 years being able to just you know embrace her because yeah. they felt that loss hugely right and during the time when we lost her like I said I was pregnant with my oldest daughter but my sister the one that's still living was also pregnant at the time. So we know that that was God's blessing that he knew that he was taking 
Aaron so my parents could get through the loss because they were becoming grandparents for the first time right. that August and September. So it's just the way God just shows up. I leaned a lot on my faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. And I'm a very spiritual person. And so I look at it this way too. We're, the, the world is made of energy. We, if we didn't have energy, we would not have the world. So when we lose someone, we lose their physical body. And, but where does that energy go? That energy still lives on. And mm -hmm. I feel like they're always with us. They're always around us. And I feel that they, th their energy, they're able to actually make a cardinal come or a possum mm -hmm. during the day. You know, these are, these are things you don't normally, you know, see, but I feel like their energies, they're always watching over us. So yes, we may not be able to hold them. We may not be able to see them, but sometimes if you really are tuned with yourself, sometimes you could feel their presence and sometimes you'll get little signs like you mentioned, you know? And I, I feel that they never leave us. They, no. we just, as humans, we can't see them or feel them, but they're always with us. I, you know, I truly believe that with all mm -hmm. my heart and I could feel their pre presence many times. I could feel their presence, you know? So I, I, I feel that they're always with us. And I, and I, I do believe when you cross over, there is a better place waiting. I feel like the earth is boot camp. We're here. They're yeah. toughing us up for something. I don't, you know, I don't know what's next, but they're they're getting us ready for something. And then I feel when they, when they cross over, I think there's something beautiful waiting on the other side. We won't know till we get there, but I truly believe that there is something beautiful on the other side. And I do believe when we call out, they hear us and they come. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I I believe that with my heart. Everyone has different beliefs, but I truly, me personally. I believe that, you know, and uh, we seem like similar creatures, even though this is the first yep. time interviewing you. So I'm sure you're like in the similar than I, you know, yep. you know same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know, my sister makes a big point about saying, oh, we need to go to the cemetery and change the flowers and do this and do that. I'm like, that's the way that you are processing your grief. But to me, I'd rather just go out and put like a penny on my dad's tombstone or, yeah. you know, seashell or something on my sisters or you know yeah. do something that they actually like instead of actually going out and put flowers all the time yeah because to me physically their body is there but I know they're not there anymore right and it's like it's like why am I gonna go to this grave and mourn when they're experiencing problems dad is free of pain he yeah. he is back to his normal weight I mean yes. my mom is back with my dad my sister right. is are free you know the other one is living her life being so happy yeah you know i'm gonna mourn and not being able to pick up the phone like I, like if i knew right now if i picked yeah. up the phone dad was still alive even though he would have been in his 80s he would yeah. have been right up here for us um i mourn that more than i mourn the fact that you know they're they're not lo longer living i just mourn the fact that i can't pick up the phone and call right yes i agree with you a hundred percent now, with all this, how did you, you know, you, you talked about, you you know, in the beginning, you realized that writing and, 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 you know, after all these obstacles happen, this is how you really knew your true path, your, your true journey. Now, what gives you what, you know, you, you become a, a true success in what you do, and you've helped so many people. What, you know, how did you realize this is it. The light bulb went off and this was my true calling in life. Because, you know, I, I think some people need to hear that because people search their whole entire lives trying to figure out what their purpose in life is. They might go from job to job. They might, you know, they feel lost in life or they feel stuck or they get up in the morning, they got to go to work, but they hate what they do and they can't figure out what their true purpose is in, in life. How did you know that helping others sharing your word, be able to write, be able to, to work with others. How did you realize what your true purpose in life was? I think it came by slowly, honestly. Like I said, when I was teaching, I was blogging. It started yeah. off as a deal on lifestyles blog. I mean, a deal and coupons blog. But yeah. there was so much competition in that. I'm like, by the time I would put a deal up, somebody else would have already <laughs> wrote about it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to move away from that. And was actually a fellow teacher that was actually encouraging me to start blogging and start doing this. Yeah. And she, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to start writing. And I started writing and I was like, I really like doing this. I like the fact that I can set my own hours. Yeah. I can, you know, if I want to work 
come in and not work, start work till two o'clock. I know it's going to be a later night for me. Yeah. Depending on what I have all my thing, but Yeah. I can also work on the go. So if my husband and I were going to visit my daughter, I could work in the car and shut the laptop up and go on and work and or go on and visit and then come back and start working again, you know, all these different things. And I honestly think that it slowly came to me Yeah. because like I said, I was doing it all along and Right. I've always been creative person in college I majored in English and communication so it was like something that I knew I was going to get to eventually Yeah. but I had to get out of my own way to get there I had Right. to look you know when they say the slogan life begins outside your comfort zone Yeah. and I literally had to get out of my own way get out of my own head and start saying you know I'm not going to let fear or anxiety or anything hold me back anymore Yeah. it used to be whenever I would do something I would tell my mom what I was going to do and she would always put that little bit of she would say something and not I know she didn't mean it but it Yeah. was always something negative always something that struck in my mind that was like fear Yes. and so I would I would not end up doing it and I would miss out on so many experiences because of it. Yeah. So I think it was right around the time I turned 50, I was like, I got an opportunity to go zip lining and I'm deathly afraid of heights. Deathly afraid of heights. And so I had a friend of mine who was still one of my best friends now, and she came along with me and I'm up there on that platform. And I'm like, I can't do this. I cannot jump. I am not. What in the world am I thinking? I'm literally shaking. Yeah. And I'm like scared to death. And I look over at her and she says, you can do it. Just close your eyes and jump. You, I have all the confidence that you're going to do this. And I'm like, I took a deep breath, said a little prayer and said, God, if you're going to take me, take me now, take me quick, because I did not want to die an agonizing death, knowing I was going to fall to my death, but I did it the very first time, and luckily, it was one that had the automatic brake system, so I didn't have to worry about breaking myself, because I think I would have run into the tree if I did, but I did it, and I was like, got there, and the guide was there, he had to help me up, because my legs were shaking, I was literally jelly, Yeah, yeah, I went yeah. to that whole course afterwards, and I said, if I can do that, I can do anything else. That's And it amazing. slowly but surely started working and, and I slowly but surely started getting out of my comfort zone. It wasn't like immediately like I'm going to do this and nothing's going to hold me back. It was like Right. I would start doing something and then that little thing would come in my mind and I'm like, oh, nope, push that thought away. And it's so Right. hard to push those thoughts away because I still struggle with that sometimes. I think we Yeah, all do. we all But do. it was like slowly but surely then I bought the blog cabin and then slowly when COVID hit and I started to realize that I miss talking to people Yeah. and I said I was in a mindset challenge with a, a coach and she was like well I challenge you you know anytime a person's challenged just do something there if they're competitive Yeah. they're gonna win she says I challenge you to go live and talk about one of your core values and one of my core values is relationships Right. and so I'm like you know I don't want to get on live. I don't want to do any of this. I don't want to be talking by myself. I cannot do this, Yeah. but I can do it with a friend. Right. So I had a friend come on and we talked about friendship and that's how chats from the blog cabin happened. It Yeah. happened during COVID. I never would have known that I would have been interviewing people from all over the world. I've interviewed two of the real housewives. I've interviewed um, the wife of the director of frozen i mean i've interviewed so many authors so many amazing people that have affected my life because they've impacted with just something that they've said some little nugget Yeah. and that's that's when i realized my whole mission in life was to give people a voice to be heard because Yeah. Right. when i was growing up my voice wasn't heard so now i'm giving people the opportunity to come on and tell their story now i may not always agree like i have people from different religions come on and i may not always agree to some of the things that they say but i gleaned something from the conversation we're sitting down we're having conversations we're learning from each other instead of yelling or talking at each other where i was talked at my whole life i wasn't Right. to I was talked at so that's my whole point and every time I get off an interview and somebody tells me oh you made me feel so comfortable this is such a great conversation it's like Yes. when you were talking about when we first came on about how it's just going to be an authentic conversation Yeah. that that is that is what I want that Yeah. is I wanted like two friends sitting down having a cup of coffee and you're happy to be in, and because we're recording you're you're in the other table eavesdropping on the conversation you know Right. I want it to be that authentic I want it to be that very casual conversation Yes. and 
it's one of the things that gives me the most joy. And then I didn't know. And the opportunity started following. Like last year, I was um, market.live. They were a tech company approached me and asked me to do 10 episodes of a DIY show for them on their site. So I did 10 episodes of the DIY show. And then it's like, you know what? I can do this on my own. So now I'm yeah. on chats from the blog happen on YouTube and I'm doing DIY and I'm getting excited about showing them all the things about the blog cabin and everything about yeah. my life. Just started doing all that. So it's just, you have to look for opportunities and you have to get out of your own way and yes. step outside your comfort zone. Exactly. And you made a very good point. The whole, everything was a good point, but the one thing you said resonated with me. We have so much anger and hatred in this world. And it's because a lot of people have their own perceptions of things but they try to push their perceptions on others. So you might have two people come in a room and one person has a completely different perception or, or opinion than another person. It doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. It's just how you perceive things and the other person perceives things. And neither is, is right or wrong. It's just the way you see it, the way you do things, the way you were brought up and so forth. So you can't be judgmental on another person because they come from a different life, a different way of growing up, and they perceive things differently. So you should respect that person. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you mm -hmm. respect their beliefs. You respect their your their you know ways of, of thinking. And you know what? Even though you might come from two pathways and two different parts of the world, or you know two different beliefs, or whatever the case may be. A lot of times you will, like you said, you'll learn something from that person. It doesn't, you know, and it, and just because you, you're you different than that person doesn't mean that you can't get along and learn something useful from that person. Mm -hmm. But we, sh you know, we, I see people, too many people nowadays lash out at other people because I believe this and everyone else should believe this, you know, it, yeah. it shouldn't be like that, you know? But I love what you're doing. And I, I think it's amazing. And I'd like to learn more about, like, tell the listeners about all the different services, all the different things that you do to help others. Okay. I have a blog called Adventures of Frugal Mom. It's Adventures of Frugal Mom, not Adventures of a Frugal Mom. I swear. I don't know how many times people get that wrong. And I'm like, guys, it's no A in there. <laughs> <laughs> that one, I share a lot of home tips and things, but every once in a while, I do get personal on there and do write a lot of personal stuff so yeah. you know just kind of look and you can kind of do that i do chats from the block cabin which is a podcast which you can find anywhere uh, that you listen to podcasts on i mean and I also do i record them in audio and video so i end up uploading those all to youtube so nice. you can if you're a visual person and you like to see who the person is talking to the other people then Obviously, you can go on and check out the YouTube channel chats from the block cabin as well. And I'm currently in the process of writing a book about called um, my search for unconditional love and finding unconditional love, my search for, for it. So, you know, I was just I was going to ask you if, if you thought about it, ha maybe writing a book is any time in the future, because the whole your whole life, you know, the, you, you de deserve to tell that story because you could help so many people with that story. And, and it's crazy because even with listening to you, I feel like we are so similar. We are two peas in a pod. And I'm like, you know, but your story could help thousands. And I told you, you know, my story and, and what happened with my story when I started to tell it. Imagine people, it, when it comes to unconditional love, people struggle with that because so many people have, you know, either they're not loved the way they should be or people have a hard time and when they other people do things and they're not in agreement, like we were just saying, you know, they they cut off that love. You know, mm -hmm. people disown people, people back away. Why can't we have unconditional love? Why can't we just love people for who they are and yeah. not have to agree with everything they do, but still show love to that person, you know? Yeah. I think that's great. I wish you the best of luck with creating that book. And you have to tell us when you launch it, because I will definitely give a shout out for you. Cause like, that's definitely, oh, thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> now tell everybody one more time, the, what your website. So they, they know where to go. Um, adventures of frugal mom. It's adventures frugal mom.com. Cause there's no of in the, the um, URL. Um, you also Instagram is frugal mom chats from the blog cabin on youtube um 
if you want to follow me on Facebook, I'm not so active on there anymore. It's Adventures of Frugal Mom on Facebook. Okay. And also, if you before we go, if you wanted to give the listeners a couple of takeaways, what would be a couple important things you'd like to emphasize to the reader, to the listeners? You are more than what people believe you to be. You have to believe in yourself and you have to take and put aside everything that's happened to you and sometimes you have to start afresh. Sometimes you have to start your own life yeah. and it's okay to hold people at distance. It's okay to say, okay, I, I can't handle this toxic stuff yeah. anymore. I remember I was interviewed being interviewed by a girl who was having a really bad issue. You know, like she felt like she was the only child, but her parents were so toxic to her. She's like, how do I cut them off? I'm like, yeah. for your own mental health and well being, you have to, you have to put that boundary there and say, right. I love you, but I can't. Yes. Because if not, you're going to continue that cycle. And I did not want to continue that cycle with my girls. Yes. I wanted, I wanted my girls to know that regardless of anything, I was going to be there for them. I love them unconditionally that I am there right there by their side. I'm their ride or die. I clap for their accomplishments. And I was trying to think of the word, and you know, yeah. I praise them for their accomplishments, but I'm right there when they're in the deep and the pits and I'm yes. right there beside them crying with them when things are going wrong. Uh -huh. And I'm there to uplift them and to empower them because, you know, they're they they're mixed. They're Mexican Americans. So they're not going to be the like the they're minorities. So they're not going to be out there achieving, you know, they have to break the glass ceiling as well. Because right on my husband's side, they're the only grandkids, and he's number nine of ten. He's wow. the only there are only grandkids that have graduated college. The rest of them haven't, they have gotten mm -hmm. married early. I mean, they live in very rural Mexico. Yeah. You know, so they've had to break that glass ceiling now and it's just for me it's my husband can look back and he has so much pride in them he's like I wish they all lived closer and stayed with us and I'm like mm -hmm. no that's a little bit too much closeness for me because we all have our own way of doing things and yes. we all have our way of you know you know cleaning house doing this doing that so we don't want to get on each other's nerves so right exactly exactly and it's okay it's okay yep. you know well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Melissa, for coming on the show. You know, I hope to see you soon. I'd love to talk to you more. This has been a whirlwind of information. And I think you've touched, you touched my heart. And I'm sure you've touched many that are listening to this right now. So thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your insight, sharing your story with us, because that takes a lot of courage and, and, and sharing, you know, the things you've learned and how you overcame all these obstacles and, and what you're doing now to help others, you know, is truly, you know, amazing. So kudos to you. And I'm very proud of you from, you know, you, you've come a long way and I really, you know, I praise you for that. And thank you for having me on the show. And I do want to say that I didn't vocally come out and start talking about this till after my mom died, because mm -hmm. I felt like out of respect for her, right? I was keep silent. Yes. But once she was gone, I'm like, my story is going to be told now. Right. My story is um, how I felt and it will growing up because I didn't want to hurt her. Right. But I'm like, I need to get all this out because it's going to fester and it's going to, you yes. know, garbage coming out, you know? Yeah. It's just going to make me feel worse. So that's, I waited out of respect for her and out of respect for my dad because. Mm -hmm. I think he would have been mad at me if I started telling the story way ahead of time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because regardless of anything, they were together 55 years. I mean, right. they, you know, that was a great love story. And it's also yeah. who I patterned my marriage on. You know, I right. knew that for us to survive, we needed to be that unit together, my husband and I, and not right. let anybody else interfere in our marriage. Right. I always say, always listen to your heart. Don't listen to your brain, but always listen to your heart and do what your heart says. Yep. So thank you for letting me come on and tell my story. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. It was, it's been an honor. You have a great day. All right. You too.